I'm Lisa Capallo. Welcome to Where's Wilmington. Today I have the pleasure of meeting with a living legend and his friend. <laughs> so this is Mr. Kelly. I'm sure any of you from Wilmington know who Mr. Kelly is. Our Mr. Kelly, the subject of this new book written by Rick Cook. Rick is a local writer for the Town Cry for many years, correct? And you still do a column for them called The Cookie Jar, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's my column. Excellent. And Mr. Kelly, as, as all of you know, anybody who lives in Wilmington and beyond knows Mr. Kelly is a former teacher and coach for Wilmington. So let's start off and talk a little bit, Rick, about how the book actually came to be. And then we'll talk about what's in the book. Oh, well, uh, about 2000, late 2006, uh, say, say, Evan, I was doing I was doing this feature article on Coach Kelly, and throughout the article, uh, I was in, uh, quickly asking about his life, and he w went over uh, when, when I was in the home, and I went, wait a minute, Coach, hold up, go back. What's the home? Because I had, I had, I had probably known, known you for, what, 25 years? Sort of. When I was at the town so crier. meaning when he walked over to you, he said, "Well, my life started out when I was in the home," and you're like, "Hold on, yeah, I never I, knew you were I, in a home." I, I, Which you were. You were in the Peabody Home for Injured and Crippled Children, New something England like Peabody that. New England Peabody Home for Crippled yeah. Children. We, we're okay and, telling everybody about this, right? Pardon? We're okay telling everybody about this. Your big secret's going to be out. Oh, gee, I blab about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the well, first the book, inkling yeah, that you I'd had. Never heard the story before. That there was more to Mr. Kelly than yes. we even knew. And uh, you know, w once I began to hear the story, uh, it took me about six m m months to convince him that there, there in, in the heat w w was a, 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 a book here. It was a, it was a, a very uh, com a com uh, uh, a compelling story right. and uh, I said well I have to tell this and uh, that's how we began, began but it was the not, journey. it was not an easy hell for him right because he thinks that it's no big deal right so I had to kind of like gently could uh, cajole him. Really? I, from what I understand, there's not a lot of gentle cajole, cajoling that goes on in your world. You're not the most gentle of guys, is that correct? Well, that's why I carry the that's stick. That's why you carry the big <laughs> stick, right? Yeah. So when Rick approached you and said, I'd like to write a book, a whole book about your life, how did you really feel about that, honestly? Well, I told him right away that uh, I don't think it was a good idea because books of one page don't sell too well. Very funny. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot more to you than one page. You know that. Seriously, well, how did you really feel? Well, I didn't think there was enough, you know, to make a book. Okay, how many years had you been teaching and coaching? Um, I taught for 41 years. Right. And I've been coaching, I think, probably 56 or so years, something right. like that. So you I, didn't think that was enough for a book? No. <laughs> no, because other people do that, too. That's true, that's true. But I don't think to the, gone to the lengths that you have. From what I've read in the book, which is excellent, by the way, I, I urge all of you to pick it up. It's really good. What I liked about it, Rick, was that I was turning pages and recognizing names of local people that I knew, people that I'd seen in the town. Steve Bjorg is mentioned in there. Kay Scanlon, who was very instrumental in getting the track named in your honor, which is yeah. really nice. And a lot of other people. Even Steve Levine from Tuxbury, oh, who yeah. actually, I am a Tuxbury girl, too. I'm sorry, but I am. And You're Steve, forgiven. Steve, thank you. Steve Levine was um, eighth grade when I was in the eighth grade in Tuxbury. Steve Levine was just hired as a coach. Well, that's so interesting. for me, hearing that name brought back a lot of fond memories. So if nothing else, the book really gives you a sense of time yes. and a sense of how things have changed. You know, yes. have you read the book? Yes. What did you think? Sounds like a nice guy. Who me? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, it was almost that I didn't recognize him in some places. Uh, I, maybe Rick had a little bit of poetic license, I'll call it. Am I right on that? Yeah, he was a, he was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, how I say it, uh, uh, apprehensive right. as to how I was going right. to tell this. Right. You know, because it is, it, I mean, it's, it is the uh, complete, uh, complete uh, arc of his life. Right. And uh, I say he's a little apprehensive right. about it. Right. And you're a pretty humble guy, Mr. Kelly, wouldn't you say? Well, sometimes I'm a little bit too cocky. 
I heard about that. Yes. You and, and throwing things at the PA system and, it, and it, all of that. It deserved it. I, I believe that. It. I believe that. I killed it three times. Excellent. What made you decide to become a teacher? I had a fantastic teacher in high school, mathematics. I went to St. Charles High. Was that Sister Anata? Sister Anata, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, she was just a fantastic teacher. I had it for four years of math. And uh, I made a decision, I think, by junior year that I was going to be a high school math teacher. And I said I was going to be a coach. Now, for someone who had never uh, played in high school, you know, played with friends outside, but in high school, uh, I think the uh, being a coach was sort of a long shot. Right, especially we know that you have had a physical infirmity. You had tuberculosis, is that correct? That's right. Yes, and that's why you were in the Peabody Children's Home, because in those days, children that had illnesses like that, they were kind of confined, is that correct? Well, yes, but uh, mine settled in the hip. Right. There were quite a few kids in the home who had a tuberculosis of the hip. Right, and you know, that was really hard for me to read about the journey that you took, and Rick has mentioned to me when we talked about it, that at the time, the care they were giving you was the state-of-the-art care, but it sounded like you were isolated quite a bit as a child. You spent how many years in that home? I was in the home for over nine and a half years. It's a long time. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but in specifically in isolation, I don't think I was in too long, but I knew that uh, when I got there, uh, they isolated the newcomers for right. three weeks. To make sure you didn't give the ki other kids anything or that you didn't contract anything as well, right? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I guess your mom could only come to visit, what was it, once a month and on your birthday, something like that? Once a month and the birthday, the first Sunday of the month. Wow. And as my mother said to me once, uh, those months that had five uh, Sundays, Right. she said those were tough. Right. Yeah. Right. How do you think that affected your relationship with your family? I know you have a sister, Jackie, and it sounds like from the book that when you were finally allowed to come home, which I'm sure was an incredibly happy day for you, it seems like you assimilated right back into your family. But how was it for them not having you around? Have you ever talked about that? I don't think I've talked about it. I don't recall talking about it, let right. me put it that way. So maybe it was the times, the way things were then. This is kind of how life was, and you just sort of got on with it. And that's kind of your life philosophy. Well, that's it. I, I, you know, when you've been in there so long, um, let's see, how do I put it? You sort of expect it. Right. You know, and uh, I'll use the phrase that I use frequently, Rick. Mm. <laughs> it's no big deal. It's no it was big a big deal. deal. Believe yeah. me, when you read it, folks, it's pretty, <laughs> um, pretty serious stuff. It was, I was kind of in tears a little bit really reading about what you went through and I have to say that um, that's a lot for a little kid yeah. to live like that but I guess like we say that's the way things were at the time so you got out of the home and then you assimilated back into traditional school systems right oh yes okay and then you went off to college after you graduated yes and where did you first teach I know where it is do you I well first I uh taught in the Gate of Heaven High School in South Boston. Right. I taught there for 10 weeks because uh, one of the nuns uh, was sick and they needed someone to replace her. And someone had to take, uh, teach rather mathematics and French. Right. Did and you speak French? No, but I could read it like a bandit. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So you just went with that challenge. You just figured somebody needs to do it, and I'm going to step up and do it. Yeah, the, uh, I did student teaching at Waltham High School, and the uh, supervisor at, uh, of the stu student teaching program at BC right. uh, came into a classroom. I was helping a kid, coincidentally, from South Boston. I was tutoring him. and. Um, the, uh, sub the uh, supervisor of the student teacher came in, found me in one of the classrooms. Usually I'd find an empty classroom, close the door so I could be, so we could move around and talk right. and so forth. Right. And I did that. And he said, they need a teacher who can handle French and mathematics. So I taught Algebra one, Geometry, Algebra two, 
French one, two, and three. And uh, wow. I you went still to speak French to this day? I told you I never could, <laughs> <laughs> never could speak it. That's interesting. That's I, interesting. I, I, I saw. <coughs> That's kind of funny, actually. <coughs> I, I know uh, in college, in the French class, um, the teacher would quite often say to various students, pose une question, something like that, and meaning ask a question. And I was hoping he'd never ask me, but one day he said, Monsieur Gailly, pose une question. And I looked at him and I said, quel âge avez-vous? No, 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 no. I asked him how old he was Oh, <laughs> in French. Well, that took care of that, <laughs> didn't it? That's why right. he never called on me again. <laughs> now, you taught in Maine for a while also, too, right? Uh, yes, I I thought an academy up in Maine. Okay, and that was just before you came to Wilmington, right? That's right. I was up in Thornton for four years, okay. almost four years. So how did we get blessed enough to have you? How did that happen? Um, you get a lot of time. <laughs> well, Give me the short version, um, as best you can. First of all, I, I, I'll start near the end. What precipitated my moving from Thornton Academy, I get fired as the, really? as the basketball coach. They had about five reasons. One of them, I didn't go to a clinic up in Maine, but I went to one down in Connecticut. Another one, they said, uh, I, uh, this one I laughed at. I had to laugh at it. They said, um, I, let's see, how did they put it? I couldn't get along with the kids. And really? I laughed like, I said, if you get invited to kids' houses for a supper or a lunch or something, and, and that means I couldn't get along with them. Then I guess I couldn't get along with them. But anyway, that... None of which is in the book. Right. So this no. is inside information, which is kind of good. <laughs> I kind of played down that aspect. So you left, yes. you left Maine, which was, you know, their problem and our blessing. Well, and then you came here. Yes. But when I left Maine, I hated to leave Maine. Yeah. Because uh, I really get to like the kids that I teach. Right. And uh, I remember when the headmaster called me in and uh, said, Frank, the Board of Trustees would like you to resign as the uh, wow. uh, basketball coach. I said, well, that means I'm out of here. He said, they don't want you to leave as math teacher. I said, no, I work on my own terms. And, uh, and it was during a free period that I had, so uh, after the headmaster, who was a fantastic guy, I really liked him a lot. And after uh, we talked, I went out and I walked around a sort of quadrangle that the school was on. And I walked around and around and I cried my eyes out because it was, uh, you know, I hated to leave the kids. Right, right. But, uh, but that's the only time you've ever been asked to resign a teaching position. Is that correct? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Now yeah. that's pretty darn good in 40-something <laughs> years. That is pretty good. Oh, boy. That's excellent. <laughs> that's sort of funny. Now, Rick, tell us where we can get the book and we can get more information about Mr. Kelly. Sure. It's and then uh, the we'll, we'll, uh, we'll website. Tell folks what you see at the website, when you get there, there's some links there, too, yes. that you can find out where Mr. Kelly's going to be if you want your book signed, if you want to chat with him a little bit. There's a link on, on Rick's website where you can get the book. So let's talk about Yeah, the uh, website is fr uh, frankkellybook.com uh, and there's a actual link to the ha Harvard bo bo Bookstore. Excellent. And the order form comes up and uh, there's also a l l link on the, on the uh, w w Hamilton Alumni w right. website. Also, I, I got some very uh, exciting info the other day. In just three days, the Harvard bookstore sold out of the in-store right. copies. So what are you going to do with the millions you guys make? So, oh, I think we're going to do You well. guys going to go to Hawaii for a couple of weeks well, or something? Well, you want to tell them, Coach? We're going to count it. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Being a math uh, whiz, after that we should count be good. It, uh, after, uh, what I'm doing is uh, I'll add it to the uh, Wilmington. And uh, scholarship, the Kelly Family Scholarship Excellent. that I give each year. I give a couple of them each year. Right. And there's 600 odd dollars, a little bit more than that, right? 
seven hundred and sixty three dollars okay the class of 1961 will understand the number right. excellent <laughs> yeah. all right we're going to take our midpoint break here and when we come back we're going to talk a little bit more about the writing process rick i want to know what you feel was the ongoing theme from all the stories that you heard about mr kelly and we'll also talk a little bit about why you're a little stinker and why you wear that hat that you're not wearing today so we'll talk some more about that. Stay with us. We'll be back with more of Where's Wilmington, our Mr. Kelly and Rick Cook right after this. Passing gas in the presence of others is not only inappropriate. That is so foul. It can be deadly. Passing gas releases a fog of carbon monoxide. Grandpa. And other poisonous fumes that can contribute to asthma and pneumonia. You're killing us over here. Kids shouldn't be exposed to secondhand smoke. Don't pass gas, take it outside. You are looking at the cover of Our Mr. Kelly, which is a book by Rick Cook that details the life and times of a living legend, Mr. Frank Kelly, who's, well, many things, actually. Rick, what are some of his honorary titles, if you will? He's in the Hall of Fame. In, in what else? He's in uh, Massachusetts Interscholastic Track Hall of Fame, right? You were? Yeah. Were, 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 Wilmington, a good guy. Oh, right, the good One guy year, award in Wilmington, yeah. The, uh, the Grand Marshal, the 275th anniversary. Parade. Uh, he uh, he uh, he happened to coach a 1974 spring track team that snapped Andover's 93 meet winning streak, which was quite an achievement for that day. Right. Being a, a small school from uh, Wilmington High School that was at, at the time was kind of looked down upon in, in, right. s in some NBC uh, uh, circles. Well, we but hadn't won that, anything in a million years. What do we expect, <laughs> right? But after that time, they would never look, uh, look down upon again. Right. So he helped uh, uh, alter the uh, high school spring track, uh, winter track, and, and, and across country landscape right. uh, in, in, into town. He also began the, f uh, the, f uh, the f f first wo woman's uh, tra tra track pro program. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, 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 monu a monumental thing at the right. time. Right. Uh, before uh, before uh, Coach Kelly uh, came along, this was known, known as, a, as, a, as a football town. And that's basically it. And he helped put tra 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 track on the on the uh, uh, landscape, he right. he actually ma ma made ra ra I mean tr tr uh, tr 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 track all about having a good time. Right. And it wasn't always about who doing was your best. Yeah. I think is right. the the plan. Right? right. You would be cheering for kids who would run the track in an hour practically, and you'd still be clapping for them, which I thought was kind of neat. And the reason you did that was because as long as they did their best, you were okay with that. Is that right? Oh yeah. Right. That's kind of an interesting philosophy, and I know a lot of the coaches that are mentioned in the book uh, adopted that philosophy and realized that as long as the kids are doing their best, not every kid is going to be, you know, the the best gold medal winning runner, but everybody has a right to achieve their personal best, right? Steve Levine, who's uh, retiring now into to, into Oaksbury, he was one of the for for uh, the for first p p people that was really really. Uh, influenced by by, uh, right. by, uh, by Coach Kelly, from from his whole career, right. you know, at the you know at the high school, he ad adopted that mm -hmm. just to, to, to the very best you can. So, how does philosophy. a Tuxbury boy, meaning you, <laughs> end up writing about a Wilmington legend? Because you know the Tuxbury Wilmington mm. thing, I know too, because I'm from Tuxbury. <laughs> How did that happen? Do you think that made you more objective? It was uh, it, it was kind of kind of interesting in that it probably took took uh, a quote and an, outs an outsider to come in, right? To 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 who this from an obj an obj an obj 
active point of view. I didn't have a lot of preconceived no, uh, no, no, notions about, about Coach right. Kelly. Which is I mean, good. I mean, I knew him from coming into the town crier office and saying, you know, how you doing, Coach? Here's my stats or whatever. But I'd re really never sat, at the, uh, sat down with him for like hours and hours mm -hmm. at a time. And uh, one of our earliest conversa uh, conversations, uh, he said, uh, you know, is there, is there going to be anyone else in this book <laughs> besides me? I said, there's going to be hundreds of people, Coach. Right. Hundreds, hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of stories. Right. You know, and they're all... And there are. Yeah. And even yeah. David Boyeri wrote the uh, foreword, which yes. is pretty funny, yes. talking about how you're a Tewksbury guy yeah. and how ironic it is that somebody yeah. from Tewksbury would write the book. And now your first television debut in Wilmington is by a Tewksbury girl, so mm -hmm. I guess you just can't escape that town. I don't oh. know. Oh, but it isn't my first television interview. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> You lost. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, first one done by a Tewksbury resident, I hope. <laughs> but we all love you anyway, whether we're from Wilmington, Tewksbury, whatever towns we're from. And you've got some friends from Reading and Waltham, mm. too, because you've actually taught and coached a lot of different places, which we were talking about a little bit before. Mm. In Weston, also. Yeah, Weston, yeah. too. Rick, what was it like um, talking to all the different people about Mr. Kelly? And if there is one running theme in all of the comments that you've gotten about him, what do you think it would be? Uh, g g genuine lo love, uh, uh, he's admired vir virtually everywhere, uh, uh, you know, uh, respect, you know, that was number one for me, right. you know, because I've always, you know, res 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 respected him and had, 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 had um, uh, hired him a bit, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I, I used to see him out there in the helmet, you know. Yes, where's Chip, that come helmet on, Johnny, today? Come on, you I know, was expecting so. that helmet today. You could use it with the lights in mm. here. Yeah, maybe I could. <laughs> mm. Why did you start wearing that? I know people have given you helmets as gifts, yes. too. What was the whole Be shtick behind that? It's not a fashion statement. Just letting you know. Oh, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely makes you well known, I'll give you that. Yeah. Um, I don't tan on the face. Right. And at the, I used to steal Johnny McKenna's helmet that he had, and I'd put it on <laughs> until he got it back, you right. know. And uh, then I started wearing one. Uh, Charlie, Charlie, his older brother, gave me that for Christmas. And I, so I started wearing a helmet. And then when that one broke, I got another one and another. I think this is about... The one I have now, it got broken last spring. It was blown off when I was coaching up at Reading, and it uh, fell on the hard ground and cracked. Mm -hmm. But I haven't found another one yet. I haven't looked for one, in fact. Well, but I'm I sure still after have this it. airs, you'll get plenty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People will be sending them to you in droves. A lot of gifts. That's, yeah. So that's your fashion statement, I guess. You stuck with it. That, yeah, that's you, you'd right. You like to stick with things. You're pretty much a regimented guy, wouldn't you say? I would say so. Yes, I yes. would say that too. Yeah. And what's with the walking stick? I know you need it for balance, but I understand that some folks in the town presented you with two options of walking sticks, and Tom Pizzero was one of the people who was there with Dick Searfus for that, right? That's right. Um, I was coming across the common from my car for one of the uh, dinners at the 4th of July week. Mm -hmm. that Wilmington puts on, and uh, as I was coming across, Tom and uh, Tom Bazaar and uh, Richard uh, Searfoss, mm -hmm. they came out each with a, uh, I'll just call it a stick, mm -hmm. and uh, they said, take your pick. So I looked at the two of them, and I took this one, mm -hmm. and uh, this one was sturdier. Mm -hmm in case I had another wall with a PA system. Right. Because now, the reason you didn't like that was because it interrupted your teaching, correct? It interrupted my teaching many, many times. Right. And I just, I threw erasers at it. And then finally one day, I was working a problem, and it had six lines, the original problem, and then the next step, next step, next step, solving an <coughs> equation. Because you always got to show your work. Oh, you're doggone right. <laughs> and, and uh, I got interrupted five times, and there were six lines. And I, got, I was over near the window in my classroom, 
and I just, I had the eraser in my hand, and I just turned and fired it. I hit it right in the esophagus, as I told people, and there was dead silence in the class. Nice. And then I heard, and then, and then everybody started laughing. I almost fell over, I was laughing so hard. Now, I understand your classrooms, although they were tough, I know that you were a tough grader, you don't believe in grading on a curve, and you believe <laughs> people um, get what they earn, I understand that. Um, you had a lot of puns and jokes, I guess, that you uh, entertained your class with. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, if, if they come, came up naturally in the mm -hmm. teaching, naturally, I'd say that. Naturally? Would I would say they naturally <laughs> came up because that's who you are, is what I would say. Where did you get a lot of your material for that? Uh, Sometimes that's <laughs> hieroglyphics because some of the stuff you said is pretty uh, pretty ancient. Your material is pretty funny. Yeah, sometimes I'd read about it. Sometimes I'd uh, something would pop into my mind, and uh, sometimes uh, Reader's Digest was a good source. Yes, Reader's Digest. Just Kane. Right. On the uh, radio when I drive from Waltham to uh, Wilmington, and uh, he was good. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in fact, two of the stories are in the book, which I purloined from Just Kane. <laughs> and, uh, well, sometimes you need a little levity. When you're doing math, math is pretty serious business. So sometimes you need a little levity. Now, let me ask you, Mr. Kelly, you've been a teacher your whole life, and I would say even if you're not teaching formally, you still probably are a teacher. What do you see is different about the way kids are taught today and the way you did it? And if there are any changes you'd like to see, can you tell us about how you feel it's different being a teacher today than it was when you were teaching? We'll just talk about math teachers. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. Calculators. You don't like calculators? I throw them in the wastebasket. Really? I, I'll take a kid's calculator and mosey up to his desk, pick it up, and drop it in the wastebasket. And why do you feel that a calculator is a bad thing? The only thing that helps is digital disc, uh, what do you call it? Dexterity? Dexterity. Dexterity, right. Dexterity thanks. So you feel it's kind of like a crutch for the kids? Uh, no, I, I just don't think, they, they don't learn their tables because they have a calculator. I'll just, well, I was substituting. After I retired, by the way, I started to substitute, and I substituted for 12 years only in the math department at Wilming, and only at Wilmington High School. And I'd walk around the class and watch what the kids were doing, you know, from the lesson, and um, I stopped at this desk, and this kid who was a freshman taking Algebra one, and um, he wrote down 3x equals 6. He drew a line under the 3x, he drew a line under the 6, he wrote a 3 under the 3x line, he wrote a 3 under the 6, he crossed the two 3s out under the 3x, reached down into his bag, which was beside his desk, picked it up with a calculator to find out what 6 divided by 3 was. Geez, even I can do that. I can. They teach that at Tuxpring now? They did. I, I went to the tech, so uh, you can't oh, you get me did. there. <laughs> I might struggle with that still, Coach, yeah. this day. So, so you feel it debilitates the student then, really? Um, I, from I, from I, doing concrete thinking, because they're using the calculator to get the answer. Yeah, that's it. He said, the, the kid was a nice kid, and he said, I just wanted to check it. Cute. <laughs> but, but, uh, what about the style of teaching? Because in the, in the golden years when you were teaching, um, teachers were able to hug kids. You could be more of a family uh, figure to the kids than you can now. I think there were things that you might have even said to the kids then that you would never get away with saying now. Times have changed. How do you feel about that? I do things the same. You would do things the same? Yeah, I'm stubborn. I can see that. <laughs> I, I, I tell people I do things the same now as I... Because I know that. you must have had some parents who weren't too pleased with some of the grades their kids got in your classes, oh, right? Oh, but that's different. You're talking now about grades. Yeah, one of my favorite stories. Uh, can I use a story that's from the book? Right? Sure, go ahead. Okay. It was the first year I was teaching at Wilmington, and <clears throat> we had open house, and I was putting my coat up in the closet. It was uh, first or second week in December. Marks had just come out. 
the kids had received their marks. I was putting my clothes out, uh, my uh, coat in the closet, and the back door of my room opened, and this lady came in, said, Mr. Kelly, I'm so-and-so, and I don't like my son's algebra mark. I said, Mrs. So-and-so, neither do I. And she stopped, and she looked at me, and I said, she said, what can we do about it? I said, nothing. I said, your son is too interested in being one of the boys. Mm. He's not interested in working hard on uh, his subject. And she said, well, uh, you know, we chatted a little bit more about it, and that was fine. Uh, she wasn't pugnacious or anything like that. I had her son again his junior year, and she came in at open house again, and she said, I noticed he passed this term. She said, did you give him the mark or did he earn hmm. it? I said, Mrs. So-and-so, I don't give anything, they earn it. She said, I was hoping you'd say that. Right. And that, 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 that was it. And imagine how the student felt, knowing that he actually had achieved that grade oh, through yeah. his own, you know, marriage, <coughs> through working. That's really great. <coughs> Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I was pleased. Uh, you know, I, I didn't antagonize the kids for the most part. Uh, many of them knew that I was teaching uh, a tough subject, and uh, they had to really work for it. Right. They had to work and do their homework. Right. And uh, ask questions. Very seldom did I answer a question. What I, they would ask me a question. And I'd ask questions that would lead them up to uh, answering the question themselves. Yeah, promoting cognitive thinking, which you need for math, which oh, is I, excellent. I, that's a big word. I never used those we'll big words. We'll look it up after we Oh, that. okay. All you right. know, you did say that you never really gave anything, but I'd like to correct you on that. I think you gave a lot of love to those kids. Because you've never been married, and you never had, let's say, a family <coughs> traditionally other than Wilmington. And this book talks about you making Wilmington and the kids and the people in this town your family. So I would like to say that you did give something. You gave a lot of love and time, which is something that, you know, you can't put a price on. That's right. But yeah. because I enjoyed teaching so much, I had a blast. Right. Uh, I but had that doesn't make you a loving person. No. What I'm getting at is your nature and your spirit, I think, is genuine that way. And I can feel that. And I just wanted to make a point to tell you that. Oh, well, you know? I appreciate that. Well, I just yeah, wanted to say you. that to you. You're welcome. Rick, what was it like for you? Um, editing all of the stuff that's in there, you know? I mean, well, you, had, you must have had stuff that you had to leave yeah. out. Is there going to be a sequel well, to this? Uh, what is, uh, what is go uh, good about the, the, this at Harvard, I can go back in at any time and add to it. Or, mm -hmm. But there are others. He had such a vast life and a, and a, and a, and a great life, and, and he's still here, and right. he's still, he's still, he's still co Coaching and right. still of, of 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 affecting thousands of lives, and uh, what what you, you just you just mentioned that he is a, r a r real real g g genuine per per uh, per person. He's honest and and for for forthright and what re really a tr <coughs> uh, ultimately a a tr to me that, uh, to, to this is that he's never. Never g g given anything to anybody unless he truly believed you were going to work very, very hard to get there. Right. Your testament and to the American values that we hold dear, and hopefully we'll continue to do that. You know, I think not only reading the book and learning about your life and people in the town, there are some lessons in there, some life lessons about traditional American values that I think if we return to some of those, and I don't want to get all political on us, but if we return to some of those, I think the world would be a better place if we went back to some of the things that you live by. What's next for you, Mr. Kelly? I guess I'll go home and eat supper. That's good. <laughs> Beyond that, any he big eats plans? very late some nights. <laughs> <laughs> Any big plans for you? I know you've got some book signings mm. to do, yeah. some touring coming up yeah. maybe to do. <laughs> no, no touring. You never know. You never no, know. The retired, uh, you want to mention some oh. of the things we're going to be doing? Yeah, that's next Tuesday, isn't it? Well, you know, the, so you've the got some events coming yeah, up. Yeah, you have the book. The book is going to be. Teachers' uh, luncheon <laughs> and uh, yeah. the Rotary Club. 
Oh, right, you're going to be speaking at the Rotary yeah. Club, and yeah. you have, I think you have a book signing or an opening at Rocco's, Rocco's that's which be is going to be early huge, in the month of October, be, right, or middle of October. Yeah, it's going to be <coughs> a huge night for the town. Right. A huge night for the town, so. Right. Yeah. Anything else you gentlemen would like to say before we close our program today? I want to thank you both for being here. Well, i like to say that it was uh, uh, just a great uh, two and a half e e years. Uh, two and a half years it took uh, you to get uh, this mm -hmm. done, huh? I How long was the editing mind. process? Editing was probably another four, four, four months. Wow. So we'll have to do a second book, Mr. Kelly, and make you stay around for a few more years. Two d uh, digital t t tape recorders I had to go on wow. and on <laughs> another one. So now he owes me four, four, he owes me four, four. Four, four, 42 bucks. All right. Well, we'll take care of that after the show. We'll make sure you get that check written. we got to get some glossy 8 by 10s for you to sign, too, because I'm sure you're going to have quite the big fan club. Eight but make sure, make sure you wear your hat for that. Well, he has one now. He has that one now, huh? Yeah, we can do bigger than 8 by 10 if you want. A fan club. Yeah? Fan oh, he club. does? You have a Mr. Kelly fan club? Well, th that could be next. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> well, you know, He's you can still get married. The There's still yes. time, you know. What, what's that? You can still get married. There's still time. Uh, shall I give my phone number? I think we can do that. We can put that on the screen. That would be the one thing you haven't done yet that you could do. That's now, right. that would be something. That I'm would be something. Yeah. I'll DJ that, that for you. I do that on the side. That's me. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for all you've given to the town. I can't speak for everyone, and I never had you as a teacher, but from what Rick has shared and from you being with you today, I just really want to tell you I appreciate what you stand for. Thank and you. I thank you for being here. Rick, thank you for taking the thank time you, out of your busy schedule to be here and share this. Thank and you. also to write the book. Um, you know, it's nice to have a legend here that we can physically feel, touch, and see. Usually these kinds of things are written posthumously, but we're really glad that you're here to share it with us. So we thank you. You're thank welcome. you, everybody, for watching. The information on where you can pick up the book is going to be on the screen for you. When you go to the website, you'll also be able to see where Mr. Kelly will be in the flesh if you'd like to see him and hear some anecdotes and share with him some of your life experiences that have happened to you if you had him as a teacher as a result of his many teaching experiences and throwing erasers at people's heads <laughs> and all those wonderful things. But do take a look at the book. and It's a really good, good read. It's fun. And I just thank everybody for watching. And I want to remind you that the next time somebody asks you, where's Wilmington? You tell them right here and right here on WCTV. Thanks for watching.